Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. Take your seats. Uh, get some snacks. Get comfy. Get your notebooks out if you would wish to take notes. Welcome, welcome to today's uh, history lecture um, with special guest Ben Boy Official. It's a two cloud. Yes, indeed. Welcome, welcome, Yuna. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Uh, I only start at the top. Uh, hello, Jordan. Congratulations on getting first. Jordan's actually streaming, by the way, so he camped on my stream till I went live. While he himself was streaming. Hello, Jax. I'm very sorry for your loss. <laughs> and by loss, I mean not getting first. Hello, Ben. Uh, he's in the call with me right now. And hello, you know. Gonna have to leave in the middle for dinner. No worries, no worries. Um, this this quiz will count toward your, uh, your final grades. But um, depending on how uh, the rest of the lecture goes, as well as if Ben comes back for substantial uh, other lectures. We, ooh, yes, indeed, Mickey Poggers. You're having a bad day. Your switch didn't come today. Awful. I'm going to attack Amazon for this. But um, uh, this introductory talk to Rome is going to be very helpful for us because uh, Ben, President Order Number Two, I just get an A. Okay, yeah, there we go. Yuna gets just an A. <laughs> but um, this talk will be the basis for, I think I would like to invite Ben in for more guest lectures on my channel. Or, in fact, offer him a faculty position here at Una University. Uh, as me as the depart uh, the chair of the department, I would like to hire Ben full-time. So we'll see how this talk goes today. This, and then um, perhaps he'll be back on for future talks. But a few announcements before we start. Uh, today is Thursday, October 21st, 2021. Uh, today in the life of an archivist, I... Um, so on Tuesday, I actually gave a talk to the um the freshman class about how to use the archives because that's part of my job is giving outreach talks to show that our archives not only have uh materials for research but we also have materials for people who aren't necessarily just uh undergrad and grad students we have stuff something for everyone yes archives time so uh it was very cool to see all the new history majors in our program also on uh wednesday i participated in a um a history curriculum review i was interrogated by the the faculty to see about what changes they need to make to the history department in order to be more equitable in uh, the modern day and age because our model for the program and our for the degree is very outdated so we we have a pick what they call the pick 12 system and it's pick 12 history classes each of them from a different part of the world and you graduate uh, we're getting we're doing away with that because not every region is offered within the same time span of four years so what happens more often than not is that the registrar and the, the chair of our department has to rewrite certain units so that it fills something also there's a lot of out glaring issues such as um, we simply don't have a faculty that can teach this program anymore because uh, they are they are removing modern Europe and pre-modern Europe from our uh, university I would succumb to the darkness if someone interrogated me. <laughs> but for, for us, it was more like us as students were yelling at the professors. It was a, a position, uh, we were in the position to voice our complaints and we told them everything we wanted from the history of the program. Uh, I personally wanted um, the senior capstone or the undergrad thesis class to be structured uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, bumped up to, from four units to five units because it's our senior thesis. And the framework to be that um, a, we have a class day on Monday and then Wednesday and Friday, we would have a class discussion time as well as opportunities for the professor to hold workshops, career outlook, grad school workshops, all the good stuff, or just time for us to work or meet with our mentors. Cause, uh, the current system we have is Tuesday, Friday, and it's two hours. And then it's like, if we miss one thing, then we're, that, that's something we don't get for quite a long time then. Such as if the professor is sick on a Tuesday, we only get one point of contact and it's that Thursday class and it's whatever she had planned. So if we miss the grad school talk, we miss the grad school talk, right? And then, or if we have an entire week of peer review, that's four hours of the week. We don't get to work on our senior thesis and or meet with our mentors. So I big pushed for the idea of we bump our capstone up to five units and have it a three day a week class uh, with all those um, infrastructure in order to help students. I also really tried to push the idea of, um, so they wanted to increase, have concentrations for the major as well as uh, pick pick five. So we have five categories, pick two from each category if you wanted breath, but you can also choose a concentration 
in a singular category. Uh, there's a lot of pushback from the student basis. That I, I can't disclose what the categories are because then it would dox where we are. Um, but I, I try to heavily push for a, a public history, a public history concentration because um, me as a uh, me as a historian, I'm interested in going to public history. So I think adding that dynamic as well as um, experiential learning as um, as part of your degree is you work in an archive or work in a library or work in a museum. And the school facilitates that and gives you that opportunity is so much more helpful than, uh, you know, take all these classes, get an A, here's a paper, goodbye. Much more structured, much more opportunities for the school to give us the resources that they have available. Uh, but without further ado, that's all the announcements I have for this week. Uh, tomorrow, there is going to be a stream with question with air quotes. Um, we'll probably either do Minecraft or Space Old Paintings. But now I will hand the reins off to Ben and unmute. Hello, how's it going, Ben? Oh, hello. Oh, okay. yep. yep. Would you like to introduce right. yourself to the class? Hello, everyone. I am Ben Boy, also known as Ben Boy Official for legal reasons. Um, I am a uh, history education student in college. So, I mean, I dabble a little bit in all types of history. One of my specialties, or my my area of expertise geographically is um, Europe and the Middle East, which is one reason I'm talking about Rome, mm. because that was their main figure. But, and a uh, quick question on that, uh, what time period? My, my time periods that I specialize in are classical antiquity and then like contemporary, so like post-Napoleon, I'd say. Mm. That's pretty good. It's kind of my field too. <laughs> Mine's at 1789 to uh, modern Germany. But yeah, but um, history. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I just realized that so I have um, stream open on my my tablet, mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of a lag. So if anyone has any questions or anything that I missed by just you know a couple of seconds, please let me know. Also, making sure you guys can see the cursor on the screen, right? I can see the cursor. But I don't know about everyone else. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try to verbally describe the maps as, as we come across them then. Hmm. Oh, uh, what are your uh, particular plans post-graduation? And what degree are you trying to get? I'm just doing a bachelor's right now. Uh, in my particular state, there is a huge teacher shortage. So mm. I kind of like made it a mission to myself to try to like become a teacher in state if possible. Uh, um, it's fix... not going to pay much, but it's it, I think it's going to do a lot of good. Um, Fixing the national issues. That's change right there. Pog. <laughs> so yeah, history teacher, maybe a college professor someday. Mm. I mean, I can only get him so much debt, so. <laughs> that's very true, that's very true. But anyways, yeah, uh, what do you have for us today? All right, so first of all, all of disclaimers for everyone. Um, while I'm somewhat well-versed in this topic, I am not an academic expert. I have not, you know, studied or have a degree in this academically. Do not take what I present here as you know, like hard evidence, you know, like scholarly fact. Um, yeah, just legal disclaimer. And also today I'm gonna be talking about like roughly a thousand years worth of history. So it's gonna be a lot of uh, broad explanations and views of events. Um, some of which I'll get into more, more attentively in later lectures. But I just wanted to go over all the most important stuff today. Like, I'm not talking about the Roman religion um, today, which is huge for the Empire. Um, but yeah, everything just for another time. But if that no one has any more questions before we start, I'm going to get into it. So, founding the Rome. So there's this dude called Aenus. He wrote the Aeneid, um, which was basically like a the mythology of how Rome was founded. In it, um, Romans believed they were descendants from the 
the, the people of Troy. So basically the story goes um, after Troy was sacked and raised by the Greeks, the Trojans kind of had a diaspora and a lot of them ended up in central Italy. Oh, the main character. That's who it was. But so these Trojans were the ancestors of the Latin people. The Latins were an ethnic group. Not a very big one, but I'll get into that later. Um, so there's a bunch of little city-states kind of scattered throughout central Italy. One of them was called Alba Longa. And the princess of uh, the daughter of the king there got, had gotten pregnant before marriage. So she had them was in a little like picnic basket and sent it down downstream down the Tiber and a farmer or a wolf raised them and then the twins were raised by a farmer and these twins would call were called Romulus and Remus because there were a lot of exiles back in the day um, from these Latin city-states Romulus and Remus managed to get a bunch of them together um, on the banks of the Tiber and start building a city well, they both competed. They had a very, like, you know how siblings can get sometimes. Maybe a little <laughs> too much play fighting. Maybe was... Well, anyway, Romulus ended up killing Remus um, and kind of absorbed both of their, like, two little towns into one big town. And then um, Romulus crowned himself king because there's really no, no objections. Everyone liked him. He was the leader of the group. So that was the founding of the Roman kingdom. I'll leave it. I'll leave a minute for any questions you guys have about this part. Or you as well, Matt, if you have any questions. Yeah, so um, Romulus and Remus, was it confirmed to be canonical? Or do you think like part of this is like a, a little bit of myth mixing with the history? I think the wolf part was definitely myth. <laughs> um, but like, it was not uncommon for, you know, extramarital children to be exiled or like sent away mm. and i think some parts were might, might be exaggerated but for the most part i think it's pretty believable mm. for the time and uh when this uh, precursor to rome came together oh by the way thank you uh emia rice for following thank you for taking hearts and blasting farts uh when would this when this all was coming together uh was it um mainly latin groups or was there a oh, diaspora uh, you said they were descendants of troy but is that kind of multi-ethnic or is it singular latin oh because well there's no way to know if they were actual descendants of the trojans because we just mm. don't have a genealogical record mm. that far back but um the region in which the tiger was located um was dominated by latin peoples maybe mm. a few etruscans in there I'll, I'll have an ethnic map later on but like um, as I'll talk about later, a lot of the city-states were very, like, mono-ethnic. Mm. So, yeah. And also, hello, Emmy. Glad you can make it. So, I'm going to speed around a bunch of this stuff. So, <laughs> the Roman kingdom was started in 753 BCE. I mean, this was crowned. And here's a neat thing about the kingdom. Um, while there was a senate, it acted mostly as like an advisory council. But also this advisory council would elect each monarch. So the king, or the whoever wanted to be king, needed to like, you know, be good and popular enough that they would get the senate's approval. And then the the people, the commoners, the, the plebeians, would basically like give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Mm. Also, a uh, quick thing, uh, do you see Jax's question? Um, I actually don't know off the top of my head when Virgil was alive. It would have been either the early Empire or the late Republic, so around the time of Augustus. Mm. But, yeah. Um, so... Rome would have seven kings. Each of them would have a reign of at least like 20 years. So they were like 
you know, that's a fairly solid lifespan. And the map that you see on the right here, so the star is where the throne was located. And by the end of the, the kingdom, over a period of roughly 200 years, um, Rome would expand into the size you see here. It was mostly Latin, like other Latin peoples, and then Italic people, like the closer you get into the mountains. So I'll bring up the Etruscans a lot, but the Etruscans were like the dominant power in North Central Italy. They were like Rome's biggest threat for many of the early years. And I'll give another minute for questions from Matt and anyone else. Uh, yeah, when you say the Etrusc Etruscans, um, uh, were they predominantly also uh, a Latin group, or were they kind of like an outside force? The Etruscans um, were their own ethnic group. I'll talk about them a little bit more in mm -hmm. another slide. But um, they were like before before Rome became very powerful. They were like ah, okay. the biggest and strongest state in central Italy. Peoples, I should say. And will we get to why Rome became more strong than them? Yep. Oh, exciting. Exciting. Got about like 20 slides for everyone. Some of them speed running more than others. Ah, oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the kingdom is what I know the least about in terms of Roman history, which is why I'm speed running it. Hmm. But. <laughs> okay, Paul. So the last king, our queen the proud. And he's the dude you see here. I don't know why Ooh. I have a PowerPoint like laser. That's beautiful. I like. That's great. Um, <laughs> but while the other kings were like, you know, fairly benevolent, like they had their ups and downs, but this dude was brutal. He like, he was not good at anyone. So he was good militarily, which is why he was like left in power for so long. But when his son forced himself on a married noblewoman who killed herself at, out of shame afterwards, the people and the Senate, like, were just done with him. So they took to the streets and ended up, like, kicking him out of office and exiling him from Rome. And seeing how, like, douchey this guy was, everyone was like, you know, let's not have a king anymore. So then they kind of restructured the political system to give the roles of the king to... Elect, elected officials like the consuls and the the Asians the, I don't know there's about four or five major elected uh, positions each of them would be held for like one to two years at a time to make sure like no one could you know, try to be too powerful for too long but yeah and Tarquin would like, try to go to the Etruscans the Samnites all these other people to try to like win his throne back, but he would fail every time. I believe died in exile. Okay, Jax, to answer your question, in a lot of ancient city states, ostracism or exile was usually deemed as a more harsh punishment than straight up execution because like people didn't travel much in the olden days. So Forcing someone to leave and never come back to a place they knew. Um, you know, out to like the wilderness and to like all these enemy peoples. That was deemed, you know, a fate worse than death. And then I have a small question. When you mentioned Senate, is this one of the first um, civilizations to have evidence that they could you could have a democracy in ancient times or the antiquity? I would argue that Rome was one of the first states to ever, ever try a Republican model. Mm. So there were some experiments in Greece at this time, but it was very early on. Right, because Greece eventually will adopt a democracy. At least some city-states. Yeah. Because yeah. they will have a, both election and um, debate within their democracy. Well, if you... Okay, sorry. Jack, looking at this... It's date 509. Um... I'll talk about the Greeks a little bit later, but I mean, besides some trading stuff, ancient Greece wasn't like one unitary thing. So a lot of city-states acted independently from each other, which mm. is why you get like Athenian democracy and like Sparta, you know, military dictatorship. Mm. Um, but especially if you if you're are as far north as like Rome is at this time, the interaction with the Greeks would have been very minimal and would have been 
mostly toward like trading ports. Athens wouldn't adopt democracy until I believe it was like maybe the 530s. I'm not extremely well versed, but it was, it was Demosthenes. They had not as, as extreme of an example as Rome is, but they also didn't have like the same Republican structure. Mm. Republic is like elected representatives and a democracy, at least in those times, was like every eligible voter interact. I can get into another time. <laughs> yeah, that could be its own lecture. <laughs> So here's a quick geography of Italy. It was a very diverse um, region. So like in the center, you have the Latins. Hopefully you can see my laser pointer, you can look red. Um, in the north of them, you have the Etruscans. All the way down here, you have Greek colonists. Some of them have been here for hundreds of years by the time um, their, uh, the Roman Republic was founded. And then you have a bunch of other groups scattered about, like you have the Sardinians, Corsicans, the Samnites down here. And these other people are generally just called the Italic peoples because they're similar enough but also distinct enough. And then you have basically a lot of Celtic people up here. Um, keep in mind what uh, the Celts and, and the Gauls are going to be very important later on. But also, just like in ancient Greece, there usually wasn't much like one unified culture or identity, um, unless in times of war. So like a lot of the Greek city-states and the Etruscan city-states would often like fight amongst e each other, um, unless like a call to action unified themselves. Some ex some exceptions include like the Etruscan League that was like uh, Tarquina and uh, these other cities just north of Rome, and then like the Latin League uh, down here. Mm -hmm. But this is how Italy looked like for at least like a few hundred years. And a little bit of a spoiler alert, but this map shows like the expansion of Rome <laughs> uh, Italy throughout the years. Celts, like, I can talk about Celts another time, but the Celts actually rolled over a good chunk of Europe before migrations and conquests pushed, pushed most of um, remaining Celtic culture into the British Isles. But yeah, I'll be talking plenty about them a little bit later. I can't answer too many questions about this just because it's outside of my scope of knowledge. And also besides like the Etruscans and the Greeks, a lot of like writ written records are very like sparse and far between. Because people in the olden days didn't know or like to write, so it makes history hard. Ah, no archives, unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but Rome did actually have an archive Ooh. Of, of like the late kingdom and early republic, but it was burned down, and I will explain that here soon. Oh, Alexandria? No, not, not Alexandria. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, but Rise of the Republic. Um... So, the early years of the Republic are very poorly documented, partially because a lot of these early records were in the, that library that got burned. But it was basically constant warfare with, with their neighbors. Um, but because they, had, they lost some battles, they won some battles, gradually they ex expanded their legal, military, and economic doctrines to make sure that they could like try to outperform all their enemies. Um, and here's the important part when, when I said remember the Celts and the Gauls. In 390, a Gallic tribe called the Sinones beat a Roman army in in battle and ended up sacking the city of Rome except the, the, the citadel. And like this took Rome decades to recover from and they would never forgive the Sinones. And they would it would have this image that all Gauls and Celts were as barbaric as these people who sacked their home. Any questions about this?
Because believe it or not, I'm going to bring it up at like 300 years later in the timeline. This is going to come up again. Kind of a speed run, but also not really. But here's another map of a little broad um, ethnic map. So after they rebuilt from the sacking of Rome, the Romans kind of like re-upped their efforts, ended up conquering you know, a bunch of the territory from the Umbrians, and then they started winning against the Samnites and a lot of these southern Etruscans. The Samnites would be like their, their biggest rival for a good like hundred years. But eventually they overtook them and then because at this time a lot of the Greek city-states down here like uh, like Region, a Crothon, and uh, Apulia, they would um they would have a lot of infighting amongst each other. So as like a third party theater to try to get on like the good side, they would often call Rome in to like try to take care of things. Um but this you should you should remember this name, not not for not for our sake, but for maybe another lecture. <laughs> but in two eighty BC, um after after Alexander the Great died and all of his holdings kind of divided amongst generals and stuff. The king of Epirus, called Pyrrhus, uh, ended up launching an exp expedition into Italy at the head of an army, and ended up fighting Rome, Carthage, and a lot of these Greek city-states. He won, but his victories were like, he lost so many men in these battles that he couldn't like capitalize on these victories, which is where you hear the term Pyrrhic victory. From mm -hmm. because of this guy and because well one of the things Rome was strong about is they had a big population so if it had losses from you know battles in which Pyrrhic victories were won they from that much easier than other societies could so after Pyrrhus um, withdrew from Italy a lot of the remaining Greek city-states in the south ended up either becoming client states or willingly annexed Rome, which kind of like solidified Rome's control over like the entirety of South Italy at this point. Here's is actually a really interesting tale, which I'd love to talk about another time, but he's most famous for his quote unquote failed expedition in, in the, into Italy. Eat well, Jack. Yeah. Matt, anyone else? You guys had questions about this part? No, I'm good, considering that Pyrrhus will be covered later <laughs> or in another lecture. <laughs> I mean, I hope to cover it. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Oh, actually, uh, one question. Uh, Carthage on the edge. Was yeah, that... so this map is actually a little misleading because during this time when Rome was conquering central Italy, Carthage, which actually ruled over Sardinia at this time, and Corsica. This map is a bad map. Um, Carthage was fighting against the Greek city-states in Sicily, mm. and actually, I think by the 280s, they had conquered pretty much all of Sicily besides like the tips here in the in the north and the south, mm. which will lead them on a crash course that we'll be talking about here shortly. This is a rough map, but so after Serdian themselves is like the big guy in Italy. Um, well, excuse me, I got a bird. Uh, Rome would end up encountering all these other empires in the Mediterranean. One of the most important of which was Carthage. So they ruled over pretty much all of northern Africa that was ruled by Egypt. Oh, okay, another verb, sorry. Um, like I said earlier, they had one Sicily. But due to stuff I can't get into right now, 
Um, Rome and Carthage ended up fighting a period or three series of wars, the first of which lasted like 20 years, which was pretty much over who would control Sicily and like the center of the Mediterranean. Also, a little fun fact the biggest naval battle in world history happened during this war. It was about 3,000 men, I think, were involved. And a battle of Cape Economist, if anyone wants to search that up. But anyway, so the result of the first war was that Rome gained control of Sicily, and that the pay war indemnities, Carthage, ended up having to conquer a bunch of Spain to get all of their mineral resources in order to pay back Rome. And then during the Second Punic War, when both Rome and Carthage were trying to like fight over this part of like northern Spain, this is where Hannibal comes in, and all these other famous generals you would have heard of. And pretty much the result of this is that Rome got all of Carthage's Iberian territory, and they reduced Carthage to pretty much only this little city uh, in Africa. So this map is, shows the beginning of the Second Punic War. But basically, Rome whooped their ass so hard that they were left to only their one city. <laughs> also during the meantime, the, the heirs of Alexander I mentioned, which I have a whole other lecture series about, were busy fighting each other over here. But the king of Macedon, who was allies with the king of Epirus, Pyrrhus, and his descendants, which Rome later, you know, came and conquered, ended up fighting a series of wars with Rome as well, which would end up ultimately ending in Roman control over Greece. So like, yeah, pretty much all of it. And then, during this time, Rome would also begin their vengeance against who, remember, were Northern Italy and much of France. Celts, like, they kind of unified against Rome, but never strong enough that they could pose a big enough threat to, like, back Rome again. The Romans made sure of that. And because of how Roman citizenship worked, many of the new territories that were conquered or acquired wouldn't be, like, annexed, per se, but it would be, like, client states or, like, Roman and state governors. Because how, how citizenship worked in the Roman Empire is that citizens didn't pay taxes, or most, most taxes. But if you were a subject of the empire, you had a bunch of different pay taxes to pay, which is why I believe for most of the Republic, the only citizens in Rome were mostly in Italy. So the tax revenues from all these new territories is what funded the Republic. Yeah, I'll take a moment and we're moving on. All right. So, as I mentioned, um, Rome ended up controlling most of Spain and Greece as a result of the wars with Macedon and Carthage. And then it would also end up fighting a bunch of Illyrian, which is like, if you know where modern day like Croatia and Bosnia are, that's Illyria, give or take. Which is really, that story is an interesting story too because it started out as a defensive war against pirate states, but ended up being much more complicated than Rome ever wanted to, so it, it was actually easier for them just to conquer this entire coast rather than try to negotiate with all these different pirating states. <laughs> um, but also, as Rome solidified their control over Greece, all of the lesser states ended up realizing Rome was probably the biggest player in the region. So the Seleucids ended up going to war with Rome and then losing, which ultimately led to the fall. Egypt tried to play nice, which is going to come in very important later on. But then a lot of these successor states in the north, they tried to have a little like middle ground. 
and one topic I really want to cover in a future lecture um, is Pontic over here. So the Pontic King Mithridates would end up being one of Rome's biggest enemies after Carthage. Um, Rome had a really weird thing where they had um, they would always fight wars in a series of three. With the, like, the third war usually being one of the shortest ones, but always the most decisive. Three Macedonian wars, three Illyrian wars, three Punic wars, three Pontic wars. I don't know why. <laughs> three, three lucky numbers. But yeah, the result of them, um, the, like, the successor kingdoms is pretty much they they instituted their hegemony over the Easter, eastern Mediterranean here. But also you can see that the Jews have a nice little state down here too. can't remember when that came to be, but I believe as a Seleucid declined in power, the, um, the Israelis down here decided to make their own state, which would be a real pain in the ass for Rome for a long time. Spoiler alert. Um, not a moment for any questions. We'll on. Uh, I have like a few. Uh, the first one, when you said Egypt play nice, did you uh, Egypt play nice with Greece or Egypt play nice with Rome? With Rome. Oh, okay. Because Egypt would fight pretty much constantly with all these other successor kings. Mm. Um, which is one reason why uh, Judea was a thing, because it was a buffer state between the Seleucids and Egypt that they mm. like, didn't want to bother fighting over. But yeah, because this was a successor state, this wasn't like Egypt, like ancient Egypt. This was like a Greek ruling class um, ruling Egypt. Hmm. And then my second question, uh, is Assyria anywhere like um, affiliated with this? I, you say that again? Uh, Assyria. I believe by this point they were practically not stuff. Ah, okay. So I do remember them like kind of in this part, uh part of this timeline, but I don't remember where they fit. That makes up that makes sense though, because I assume that um that it looks like where it says Arabs, that's where uh they eventually dissolved into. There are a lot of like little Arab states at this time. Mm. That we can't talk about today. Ah, um, yeah. But I would love to talk about more another time. We should take notes on all the things we could branch off in. Lots of lecture. Lots in the lecture. Lots in the lecture. Yeah, did you have one more question? Uh, no, that's it. Okay. But even though Rome pretty much conquered most of the Mediterranean at this time, things weren't all, you know, fine and dandy. Um, by the end of the 100s BC, uh, Roman society was pretty much at its breaking point. So one thing to remember is that slavery was quite common in the ancient world. Not slavery as we think of like chattel slavery, but like people would like sell themselves into slavery to pay family debts and then you know be free with you know 12 years later. Like, there's a lot of different types of slavery, and I believe I. 15 to 20 percent of the population of the Mediterranean were slaves at, at any given time. A lot of these are temporary, but like a lot of the more like brutal stuff were like war captives or criminals like that had slavery brought upon themselves against their will as punishment. But a large amount of these slaves ended up being sent to southern Italy and Sicily, which is where the servile revolts happened. So if you've heard of Spartacus, um, that was the third servile revolt. Yeah, American, or like, New World slavery in the early European colonial period was much more chattel slavery, as in like, Slavery in the ancient world, like, scholars could be slaves. Like, you would have kings who would have, like, doctors and philosophers as mm. slaves. But, like, even though they were slaves, they 
lived a pretty good life. Like they weren't whipped or anything. But they were still technically property, if that makes sense. It's a whole, I could do a whole nother lecture about that. But just know, slavery varied for region and occupation to an extent. But a lot of circumstances at the time of the late 100s, early 00s BCE led to three big revolts happening, all of which were crushed. But as you, if you're familiar with Spartacus, you know that his, his revolt got close to becoming a really big problem. Yeah, more like indentured servants. And uh, defining is very tricky. Um, but also, I haven't mentioned them yet, the, the Germans. So after Rome conquered much of northern Italy, they encountered the German people for the first time. A lot of various tribes and alliances. And one migrating tribe and their allies called the Cambri ended up really like whooping Rome's ass in a couple of battles. Um, which proved how outdated Rome's military structure was. And while the Cambri were pretty much just burning and looting their way through northern Italy, um, this general called Marius decided to reform the army, which would make equipment standardized, recruitment a lot easier, just making sure the Roman army could get a lot more people, a lot more places, a lot faster. And this ultimately this peak of the Cimbri and ended up being Rome's military structure for the next couple hundred years. And then one of the final things to remember in this time is that you remember how I mentioned the, how citizenship worked? Um, this came to a head in the 70s and pretty much not quite a civil war because it wasn't like army and army but it was a lot of these italic peoples who weren't Roman citizens but pretty much were the exact same as the other people in Italy who were citizens. So the social war ended with military defeat for the people who rose up, uh, citizenship being expanded throughout most of Italy and then parts of Greece. I know I went through a lot, but anyone have any questions about that? Uh, yeah, my first is um, th was uh, when I, re I recall that Rome had a system of tribute. Is that related to the idea of slavery? Well, tribute was kind of like, it was one of the ways client states mm. were spelled. So, like, if we go back, like, it's not on here, but Thrace. Mm -hmm. Thrace was a client state for a while, which means, like, they acted, like, they self-governed, but their military matters and then, like, tax matters were sent to Rome. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like an overlordship, but you still, like, be in charge of your own stuff for the mm -hmm. most part. And then my second question was, uh, uh, earlier in the lecture, you referred to Rome having a Senate. Is it still uh, still part of their government right now? Yes, the Senate is pretty much what was in charge of Rome. So, like, mm -hmm. the, the elected officials that were put in place, or the positions put in place after the, the monarchy um, were gone. So, like, the king used to lead the army into battle. Mm -hmm. But after the king was deposed... Um, that duty was split amongst two people called consuls mm. which would pretty much have like an army of their own so Rome could fight on like two fronts if need be um, and these and the consuls are what pretty much would uh, lead Rome's army in this further expansion mm. yes, then... for this period of like 500 years give or take um, that the senatorial structure would place because new senators would only be added when new area with when new provinces with citizens were added, which is one reason why um, a lot of the aforementioned you know Italians who weren't citizens wanted to have citizenship so they could be represented in the Roman Senate.
and then uh, my yeah yeah my final question was is like uh so we get we got introduced to the social war here is social struggle and class uh social conflicts like kind of prevalent in uh, roman history because i i know the nature of democracies kind of is like prone for social violence at least in the um, early on in history well <laughs> actually throughout all history I think social here more so refers to the different like ethnic groups mm. um, and the whole citizenship stuff because I mean there are plenty of uh, not conflicts but like disagreements between the patricians and the plebeians the the, ru- the ruling class and the con- um, but like even if you remember back when I was talking about the kingdom the, the patricians realized that they needed the support of the plebeians so they would have Plebeian assemblies that would like still give the okay on you know legislation and like call to war. They wouldn't have as much power compared to the patricians, but it was like enough to make them included enough that they wouldn't feel completely isolated. Hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, we're getting to the end of the Republic now. This is. This is the juiciest part, and probably the one I get the most nerdy about. Um, even <laughs> though any person. <laughs> so after Rome conquered a bunch of northern Italy, they began making alliances and trading networks with a lot of these uh, Gallic tribes, and some of them were like you know willing friends of Rome. Like, well, I wanted the my brother to help him out if if shit was started and some of them were just kind of like begrudging the accepting of them but when when the Helvetii which were a Swiss uh, tribe ended up like marching through here which is where Rome's allies were Romans Rome's allies called them to help and the consul at the time Julius Caesar ended up coming into Gaul and kicking the Helvetii out. Then also, shortly afterwards, a Germanic tribe called the Suebi crossed the Rhine with, I think it was like 100,000 warriors and like completely ravaged this area of Gaul. And because Rome was already there, a lot of these Gallic tribes asked Caesar to help them, which he did because he's Caesar and he's an absolute mad lad. Um, <laughs> And the end result of that was the Germans were pushed back to the other side of the Rhine, which they'd stay in for another, not to be a spoiler, but another like 50, 60 years. And then basically a whole series of Rome being involved in petty and not so petty disputes ended up giving them hegemony over most of Gaul. And then another thing I want to talk about another time, written at this time, people knew about it. But it was very, like, mythical. It was like... A land of mist and tin, I think is what someone described it. So Caesar, not wanting to... But wanting to capitalize on at least being there, launched a small invasion into Britannia. And then came back. But, like, for the ancient world, this was huge. And later, Roman Emperor emperors would try to one up Caesar and then end up conquering Britain. But that's that's a story we're gonna get into later. But anyway, after he came back, a lot of the Gauls realized that they basically just gave gave Rome uh, hegemony over this entire region. So under a guy called Vercingetorix, a Gallic League made one like last ditch last ditch effort to kick the Romans out. And then at the Battle of Elysia Julius Caesar defeated them. And this was a huge army, too. It was over 150,000 people. Um, And with that army defeated, Rome kind of solidified their gains. And something that you might hear some historians talk about is because due to just how much war was happening in Gaul during this time, and how many armies were moving through pieces, things like starvation was rampant, and it was estimated that about a third of the population of Gaul uh, was either killed or died during this time. Mm-hmm. 
twice. Oh. Like the Roman Hitler. Which I don't think is apt, but like, understandable. But yeah, any questions about the, how the Roman speed ran golf? <laughs> how did it speed ran golf? If you guys haven't read anything about the Battle of Elysia, it's nuts. It was pretty much like, I won't get into it, but it was three sieges in one. With pure big brain. But most of Caesar stuff with big brain. One of the next lectures I want to do if I'm invited back is the whole lecture just on Julius Caesar. Hmm. That could work. Yes, if there are no further questions, I will move on to the next slide. So earlier before Caesar was ever consul, um, Sulla was actually a consul himself and ended up becoming Rome's first dictator like for hundreds of years. Uh, something I forgot to mention was that dictator in ancient Rome was like a nominated position and it was temporary. Like they basically would say like, you know, shit's so bad, we're going to give you total power for six months and then after that you're stepping down. Um, this was during the, the social war and stuff. Solo acquired his dictatorship. And this kind of shows in the Roman political structure. Not to mention all this new territory meant a lot of new people in Rome. Like millions and millions. So a lot of the, I don't want to call them conservatives because they're not quite like what we think of conservatives as today. Mm -hmm. A lot of like <laughs> traditions and stuff in, in Italy wanted to keep the way things were but people like julius caesar who saw how beneficial it was to appease uh, the masses just in Italy, but just around the empire or not the empire the republic um uh, the, we're gonna call them the populars because it was the optimates and the populares um, but that's a handful to say out loud so it's, use conservatives and populars for right now. <laughs> um, so with Julius Caesar already, you know, in a political faction not liked by the Senate, the fact that he conquered pretty much all of Gaul by himself made the Senate really uneasy. And they didn't want him to come back into Italy for a triumph. And a triumph was basically a huge parade and show saying like, oh, how great Rome and yourself were. And Julius didn't like being denied that and ended up marching over the Rubicon with his legions that he conquered Gaul with, which basically meant he declared war against the Senate. Well, what happened next is that pretty much the Senate pussied out and moved to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> but the other consul, uh, a guy named uh, Sextus Pompey, or Pompey the Great, he was still chums with the Senate, so him and Caesar basically fought a civil war with the two political parties being their main backers. Um, and this lasted a good few years, but ultimately Caesar came out on top. And during this time, Caesar would be crowned as dictator as well, but instead of six months, he was given dictator in perpetuity because this was like the biggest civil war Roman ever had. So his, Caesar's new senate made up of his like willingly gave him that. Any questions about that? Because this was a really like messy war because mm -hmm. a lot of the territory over here was made of client states. Some of which tried to break away from Rome, some of which supported Pompey, some of which supported Caesar. Um, Egypt was not a client state, but I won't get into it too much. They did, they had a civil war of their own, and ended up calling both sides of the, of the Roman civil war into help, ultimately which Caesar would end up coming and then winning the war for Cleopatra. Yeah. 
I'm the people doing court. We all think of questions. <laughs> Optimal time. Hydration. Excuse me. Oh, another another roar. If only this was your channel. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have increased that count by quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, one of my mods like has that command pretty much copied and pasted. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, this isn't quite the end of the Republic though. So if no one has any questions, I'll the next slide is gonna be like the actual end of the Republic. Ooh, the actual end. Yes. So Caesar was assassinated, as you guys may or may not know. And his heir, which was his nephew, Octavian, um, ended up inheriting just a load of problems. So first of all, Caesar's assassins pretty much fled back to Greece and tried to start a whole new civil war. But Octavian managed to gather enough people and crush the assassins in... Uh, don't quote me on this. Might have been the Battle of Philippa. Philippa. But anyway. Octavian also had to deal with Julius Caesar's former second in command called Mark Antony. Marcus Antonius. And they didn't get along great because Mark Antony was a good general, but he was a poor politician. Like he didn't know how to like manage people, taxes or policy. But that was Octavian strong. So Octavian wasn't a great general, but he was a good politician. So this ultimately led to them kind of like splitting control of the empire kind of along like this line. So like Antony had control over Greece, Egypt, and Asia because one of the things Caesar wanted to do before he died was he wanted to invade Parthia, uh, Mesopotamia, the Persians. So Antony wanted to kind of fulfill that wish. So he wanted to focus on that and leave Octavian to basically run the rest of the empire. But ultimately, Antony's campaign would fail. And him and Octavian kept on getting more and more like disgruntled with each other over some petty and not so petty things. Like Octavian wanted to marry Cleopatra and then start like a whole not like a dynasty, but like, you know, not too Republican. And this ended up coming to terms in what was called the Final War of the Roman Republic, in which Octavian ended up beating Antony in the Battle of Actium, after which both Cleopatra and Antony would kill themselves, leaving Octavian as pretty much like the strongest guy in the Empire. And third, decades and decades of civil war at this point, Octavian saw how much problems it's caused and then how easy things were when like Caesar was dictator, like how easy it was to pass policies and not have to worry about like, you know, senatorial jargon or petty infighting. So he decided to call himself the uh, Femur Princeps or the first citizen, which pretty much made himself the emperor. What makes this different from the, the monarchy and the kingdom? In, in the kingdom, the, the Senate was more of an advisory council, but in the empire, the Senate still had like legislative authority. Um, but the emperor still had like final say and control over the military. So kind of like Congress and president in the US today, but like, you know, much more antique. But Octavian ended up doing so good of a job. His reign was about 30 years, and his rule was called the Pax Romana, or like Roman peace, because there was just, compared to the decades prior, there was little to no fighting at all in Rome, which is why he's commonly known to, known as like the best emperor. Yeah, any questions about that? Um, did they, uh, you mentioned the dictator system earlier. Is that different from how the, the emperor worked? Would the emperor system be 
uh, perma- permanently uh, governing over the government. Yeah, so when Augustus made himself, uh, or Octavian Augustus, I should probably say, he took like three different names. Anyway, <laughs> Augustus took the title Premier Princeps and got rid of Dictator because Premier Princeps was like perpetuity. And it was heretical as well, which we will see shortly. But remember, like, Dictator and all these terms didn't have like the notoriety they did in that day as they do now. So it was those kind of things were more referred to in a political manner rather than a you know positive or negative manner. It would kind of like be how we say you know a five-star general or vice president or something, you know. Mm-hmm. No inherent negative connotation. Yes, we're going to be speedrunning through a lot of the Empire, because I only know so much. But yes, so, after the Pax Romana, um, actually I'm going to jump around a little bit here first. After the Pax Romana, Rome used their huge military might to expand their holdings further. So... They would launch two different expeditions into the British Isles, which would end up giving them control pretty much everything south of Scotland. They had expeditions into Dacia, like modern Romania and Hungary. Oh, excuse me. This one will come back later because it was really tough to fully control. But then they'd also fight the Parthians again, but win this time, and for a time, control over Mesopotamia. Excuse me. And then they would fight the Nabataeans and the, and, and the Jews, um, which pretty much give them control over this area as well. Oh, did Matt not mute himself? Doll. Uh-oh. And also the Caucasus region. They inherited part of this from when they uh, fought with Pontus. But pretty much by 117 AD, this is this is the biggest Rome would ever be. Which is huge, and I think at the height they had something like 45 million people. Which was like, I think, 20% of the world's population at the time. Which is nuts. And I will give you all a minute to ask any questions while I take another drink. So the early emperors. So Octavian founded the Judeo- Julio-Claudian dynasty. Julio because Julius Caesar, part of the Julii family, and Octavian was his nephew. But yes, he would go through about four emperors if you included uh, Augustus, and this would include Tiberius. Um, and then, most famously, like Caligula and then Nero. As it's, if you guys know anything about Nero, you know that he was a crazy mother effer, and pretty much wasn't fit to rule. And this would lead in 68 CE to pretty much a coup, which was led by jointly the Senate and the military. And the general who led everything um, was called Vespasian. And everyone pretty much agreed that he was probably the best person to put on the throne instead. And this would start the Flavian dynasty. And they ruled like, okay. Like, not great, not terrible. But over the next like 20, 30 years, they would lose influence and 
he proved to be, I think, mediocre is too strong of a word, but like, they're obviously more talented people for the job than the people who ended up ruling. Which would lead to probably one of the periods of the empire, which I know of, which is the five good emperors. Something to note about this is that these weren't like sons, uncles, or nephews of each other. Um, each one of these emperors was chosen like by a non-relative. Um, they were chosen because they would they were good picks or the previous ruler thought they were the right person to rule. Which is something yet you won't see like hardly anywhere else in the empire. Or hardly anywhere else in the ancient world, to be honest. But starting with Marcus Nerva, each one of these rulers would do something to make Rome great, quote unquote. So what Nerva did was pretty much consolidate and solidify all the mess ups the previous emperors did. And then Trajan would be, he would be the military mastermind. So if you ever heard of Trajan's column, this, that was dedicated to him. He's the one who conquered um, Dacia and Mesopotamia. This dude was a mad lad. He, I don't think he ever lost a battle. Um, and then he's the one who brought Rome to his territorial height. But the next emperor, Hadrian, saw that, you know, maybe Rome's a little too big, and this is a lot of territory to try to, you know, defend properly. Scaled back Roman um, territory in places like Dacia, Mesopotamia, and even in Scotland, and focused on, you know, making sure the empire was good enough defended, which is why you'll hear things of, like, Hadrian's Wall in England. He, he focused less on, you know, offense and more on defense. And then another thing that the, the campaigns of Trajan did was bring in more people and then tax a lot more people as well. If you remember how citizenship worked, it meant a lot of people were being taxed. And this would result in a lot of revolts in a lot of the border regions. And Antonius Pius would end up putting down these revolts and kind of like easing some of the tax taxes on everyone and then arguably one of the coolest of the five emperors which came next was marcus aurelius he is called the philosopher emperor because i believe he was a profound stoicist um he wrote a book called the meditations which if you haven't read it i highly suggest it it's a good read um, he was a reluctant warrior, like, it was during this time he fought the, the Marcomannic Wars against a, a coalition of German tribes. But he didn't want to fight. Like, if you read the meditations, you can see just how he thought of what it was to be emperor and how life was like in, in the day for, for someone like him. And he was a sponsor of the arts as well. It was during this time that historians like Cassius Dio would see a lot of prominence as well. If that doesn't ring a bell, Cassius Dio, great historian, highly recommend. But sadly, these are called the five great emperors for a reason, because the emperors that came after them were shit. Small but, question, uh... Yeah. Timeline on the previous slide. This one? Yeah. As in, like, uh, what, what's the time period we got going here? Oh, so this was, like, from the late 90s to the late, like, 100s. Hmm, okay. okay. I would say each of them had a reign of, like, 20 to 30 years ish. Okay. -ish. So it's pretty much a century of good times. Mm. Any other questions? 
No, I'm good. Are there any emperors to read about? These are five I would highly recommend. So, speedrunning, I just call this the O time. So, Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, he was... Think of a, uh, if a frat boy was emperor. That's pretty much what happened. He did not do a good job. He oh, that's spent a, way too much money. That's big uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think he only, he only ruled for like two years before people like done with his shit. And then he was assassinated. And... A general called Septimius Severus um, ended up being put on the throne instead. And this started the Severan dynasty. Well, Severus himself wasn't that bad of an emperor. His successors just couldn't get along. So, like, fratricide, there's a lot of other political issues, as well as, um, like, global temperature changes and other stuff, made the political climate really unstable. And eventually, this led to Rome breaking up in three. So we have the Gallic Emperor Empire here, which is pretty much one general decided to take Britain and Gaul. And say, like, you know, screw you, we're going to make our own country with the blackjack and hookers. But, you know, not. And then uh, fighting the wars against the Parthians and later Sassanid here in the east. Uh, to a lot of the people in the armies here being very like independent like being that they thought people back in Rome relied on them more than they relied on Rome so a queen or a noble woman called Zenobia would ultimately take power to start the Palmyrian Empire so this basically started the crisis of the third century. So you had three different people claiming to be like, you know, the true Rome. And during this time that you also had a lot of, I don't like using the term barbarian, but a lot of like external Germans, Slavs, um, horse nomads coming in and causing a lot of chaos. So whoever was in charge of actual Rome, I would say, um, always had their hands full and then, you know, they couldn't always do their best job, which led to even more instability. So Galerius, which I don't have on here, he started like validation and then his successor, Aurelian, which I think is literally the most Chad person to ever exist. Um, he literally solved all of the invasion issues. He kicked Palmyre's ass in two battles, sacked the city twice, and he was so much of a Chad that he didn't even need to fight the, the, the Gallic Empire. He literally just walked in, and the Senate killed the fake emperor and just handed over all of his territory to Aurelian. And pretty much, he was called Restorer to Orbitus because Restorer of the World. He did this all in two years. And he... Ah, he's so goddamn cool. I could do a whole lecture on him. But he was sadly assassinated because of petty rivalries. Um, and jealousy. His reign only lasted five years. But yes, he officially brought the end to the crisis of the, of the third century in about 273, 275 AD. Any questions about that? I'm good on this one. Okay, another speedrun. Petrarchy time. So, Aurelian's successor realized that the empire was just way too big, way too freaking big. For like one person to govern themselves. Um, so after, you know, with some failed attempts, a dude named Diocletian took, uh, took over as emperor. Excuse me, in 284, and he instituted a lot of different reforms. 
So two notable reforms as he re-standardized the Roman currency. As, as, as you can imagine, if you have three different people printing their own different money with their own, their own different inflation rates and stuff, you're kind of kind of ruining the economy. So he tried to bring everything back together and make sure the Roman coin was worth something, which was a huge help, especially for funding public works projects and paying the soldiers who fought. Um, and then probably one of the most important things he did is he came up with this system called the Tetrarchy, which the empire is split in half, kind of like how Octavian and Anthony split the empire. But instead of just one person controlling each half, there was an Augustus and then there was a Caesar. So the dude, like the Augustus was like, the big guy in charge, but the Caesar was like, if the Augustus were to die, or deemed unfit to, to rule, the Caesar would take over, and then they would appoint their own Caesar afterwards. So it was pretty, it was called the Tetrarchy because it was four people who ruled the empire. Um, this only worked well for so long though. And after the first, like 20 years of this, there's way too many people trying to say like, hey, I'm Caesar. No, I'm the, I'm the right Caesar. I'll fight you for it. And so they did. Um, a lot of civil wars erupted over generals, um, nobles, pretty much anyone trying, who, who could try to claim their role as Augustus or Caesar. This would come to an end with Constantine the Great. Um, he was one of the, one of the Tetrarchs, and after his, um, his Augustus was killed in battle, he killed or subdued the other uh, Caesars and Augustuses in the Empire, and kind of like re-centralized power, but realizing that a lot of Roman stuff was kept way in the West, you know, in like Italy, Spain, etc. He relocated his uh, capital to Byzantium, which he called Constantinople after himself. And he was also the first emperor to be openly Christian. Another thing I couldn't talk about much, but Christianity, people like Diocletian really, really hated the, the Jews and the Christians. They really like, went on public manhunts and killed tens of thousands of them. He meant for being openly Christian and then preaching, you know, religious toleration. It was a huge win for a lot of minorities in the empire. Um, and Constantine started a dynasty, which would be very short-lived, but Theodosius, after seeing that, you know, one, one empire ruled by one person is a little hard to manage, he decided just to split the empire in half um, with one person, with one emperor for each. Um, but this came at just the perfect time. But before I get into that, does anyone have any questions? If not, I will go ahead. So, during this time, there was another, you know, global temperature change, and also during this time, um, a huge nomadic empire from the steppe emerged, um, which is, you know, Tila went out to be the king, or the ruler of, and the Huns, they, they conquered a lot of people, but also a lot of people didn't want to be conquered by them. So they migrated western, like more west and more west, until they eventually crossed into Roman territory. But Rome obviously didn't want all these tens of thousands of people settling in Roman territory without, you know, being actual Romans. And that caused a lot of conflicts. Some people ended up being hired as like mercenaries and being given parts of land in the empire as long as they serve as a federati, which is kind of kind of like a Roman military, but not 
Roman in like design. So welcome back, Jax. Um, you missed a couple hundred years of history. Or almost Quite history. literally. <laughs> um, but yeah, the proved to be a huge, huge pain in the ass for, for both uh, East and Western Empire. But eventually the Western Empire ended up winning a pure victory over the Hun, and Attila died. But the damage was already done at this point. And after some inept rulers in Western Rome, um, a lot of the Germans who came into the, the Empire forcefully or peacefully ended up kind of just taking whatever land they could for themselves and pretty much led to the end of Western Rome. Yeah, but over in the East, things weren't as bad, but they still saw. Because they had Slavic and other German people still trying to invade and like race and European holdings. And then they had to deal with the resurgence of the Sassanids, which is a new Persian empire um, in the East and like Mesopotamia. So like resources were already spread thin. But yeah, that, that's kind of marked the end of Rome is Rome. I consider the Byzantines, which is what East Rome would be referred to as, as Roman, but as a different stage of Romanness, which is why I'm not going into that, because that's just a whole cluster. Yeah, I totally agree, especially with how it... Um, not only that, but it, I, so, some would argue that the Byzantines would eventually... Um, transition from being part of Western civilization to, you know, being part of the history on the East side and being kind of involved in the Middle Eastern history, as well as eventually influencing uh, Russia and how it emerges. Uh, which half actually had a Roman? It was the Western half for, for most of the most of the time. I won't get into it. But... <laughs> yeah, after, after the city of Rome itself got sacked like twice, um, the actual like the actual power of the city of Rome was more symbolic than anything else because after being set that place there's not much left there there's honestly so many different assassinations I, I didn't I think I only mentioned like maybe 10 or 12 emperors by name there's there was like 40 or 50 something I want to say like, going back to the crisis of the 3rd century, during a period of 6 years, there was 9 different emperors, I think. 9 or 12. That, that shows you just how messed up things were for a time. Um, did Antium actually have the record for the emperor? Great question. And one of the things I couldn't get into was the Praetorian Guard, which were honestly one of the worst things to ever exist. <laughs> but this is and that, that was just a brief history of Rome. About a thousand, eleven hundred years worth of history. But if you all had questions, I would to ask or answer. Sorry. Yeah, like let me know which stuff you'd want to hear me talk more in depth about in future lectures. Mm. Well, you can do everything, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I'm only so well versed in so many things. Here. I see. Uh, but if you wanted to do a full lecture on uh, any of the topics we've talked about today, you know, that'd be a great time to also. And Julius Caesar is one that I definitely feel well versed enough in. To do. Um, I could also do Alexander the Great if y'all would want to. I know it's not Roman, but like. Alexander the Great was a bisexual Chad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was. Honestly, not as long as I thought it would be. I was about 25 to get this stuff. Well, now you know 20 slides is about a class. 
Uh, how long is stream so far? Hour 30. Alright, okay, that, that looks pretty good. Yeah. Actual class. So now you know if you ever wanted to uh, do another about 20, about 20 slides with Q&A time is uh, about where you should be hitting. When you could do a leap even less if you would like to do a little bit of a shorter class. But is it time for everyone's favorite part of the lesson? Quiz? Ooh, quiz time? I mean, I didn't actually like get a quiz ready for everyone, but I, I, I can ask just a couple of questions to see. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we can do we can do uh, quiz for no points, quiz for no points. Yeah. Oh, everyone who answers in chat gets a, f a free five out of five. So, you'll get bonus points if you get more than one. But can you guys name any of the five good emperors? Oh, that were mentioned earlier. We got Vinci with C C C C C C C. Awesome. This, this is not multiple choice, but Matt feel free to answer as well. <laughs> any of the five good emperors there's only five of them I want to see if anyone can get all five well I, I want to wait for a few answers before I say my piece so, so people just don't copy orally I think we're just going to have a blank screen for a little bit oh we've got a mark somewhere Oh, we've got Trajan. That's pretty good. So, Vinci and Jax, congratulations. Both of you get a yeah, 5 out of 5. So you both get at least 1 out of 5, yeah. which is good in my book. Yeah. For me, uh, my answer is Trajan, Hadrian, um, Anthony? Or, what, what, what's, a, what's another way to say Anthony? Because I know Anthony. it's not Anthony. Antonius! Antonius Pius. Hadrian was one of the five. No, not Mark Anthony. And then Marcus Aurelius. How many did I get? Four? Yeah, that was four. The the, the fifth one escapes no one, me. No one remembers the first one out of the five. <laughs> like, in general? Um, say that again? In general, people don't remember the first one, usually. He's, like, the least popular out of all the five. Okay, that makes sense. Because, um, like... You brought up an example for each of them. Yeah. That like is rememberable, like Trajan's column, Hadrian's wall. Yeah, the the first one was uh, Nerva. I believe. Nerva. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, Nerva. Nerva. Not Nerva sounds weird. It's Nerva. <laughs> All right, Google. It's time to open the grade book. Congratulations, Jax and Vinci. For a five out of five, Yuna gets an A as well, just because she's Madam President. You all get S for SQPR. Yeah. SP four. Populatum Cista Romana. I believe that just means for the Senate and people of Rome. I can't think of a couple other questions if y'all want. I want to be tested. It'd be a day when you're free of the university, the, free, the tyranny of Yuna. I think that happens after you graduate with your bachelor and you go to a different school. <laughs> uh, graduation. Ugh, I still got another year or two. Mm. I hopefully have just next semester. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to graduate with honors, but I may, I don't meet all the requirements. And I may not have enough time if I want to graduate next semester. But you know. Sad. But uh, thank you guys for joining us for a very special lecture by Ben. Thank you, Ben, for coming on the show and giving Glad to be here. the lecture on Rome. I'm very interested to see, because um, this is a very introductory talk. We get we have, we have got introduced to a lot of topics that we could explore. A lot of interesting yeah, things, the too. The world is pretty much like one of the things that got me into history, besides like World War II, but that's another story. Hmm. Um, but I... I like to learn a lot about it. Like a lot of the actual like books I have in my room are regarding ancient history and ancient civilization. So I, I love talking about it for anyone who wants to listen. Mm. It's just like you saw how big Rome was. This the scale and power of a lot of these countries, like compared to you know medieval Europe or whatever. I like you know the. 
the later history that came afterwards just feels so pale in comparison just to how huge and amazing these empires of old were. Yeah, I'd be happy to come back again sometime. Yeah. And maybe we, like, turn this into, like, a, uh, it's, like, the full department thing where, like, um, it's, like, students are taking different classes at different times. So, like, I have the uh, pre-modern going on, and then you have Rome going on, and then together, that actually is a 60-unit, 60-unit <laughs> thing from how much? Yeah. I don't think they'd let us talk about World War II on Twitch. Oh, well, well I, I think they would, considering I think uh, we're a history channel, and I believe that. Our audience isn't big enough where they're not gonna where we're gonna have large groups of people offended about what we're talking about. Plus, um, eventually, I am gonna explore my thesis here on stream about how democracy isn't always the answer and the responsibility it bears for the failures of the German revolutions of 1848, as well as um, I may be doing an honors thesis, so a second senior thesis on the results of that in the Weimar Republic in Germany and how. Because the failure of democracy, we have Hitler. So definitely, a, definitely a cool angle. And during the year eighteen forty-eight makes me moist. Yeah, big big year for Europe. Yep. Hey, how yeah. in textbooks it's like skimmed over. Bad. Yeah, yeah, but that's the that's the nature of textbook writing. It's flashy all for like all the five images, and that's it. I am glad that we had at least a few people coming by and being nerdy with us today. Yeah. I appreciate all the lurkers who just want to come by and, like, learn for a few minutes. And the people who came and, like, actively learned, actively asked questions, came and uh, asked, uh, participate in the quizzes. Always, uh, I, I'm keeping track of you, y'all. We got v Vinci and Jax. Vinci, Jax, and Yuna, they've been killing it. They've been killing it. I will I say, just for my next point, I come by. I was debating whether or not I'm making this presentation like comedic, hmm. like comedic in nature, just because I know some people remember things easier when it's presented with some comedy involved, like when yeah. I say like golf speed run any percent, like, yeah. instead of just having, you know, one title or one slide like that, if I made like more of a PowerPoint like that, if you guys would be, um, if you guys would prefer that kind of presentation over a more, you know, standardized one like I did today. Yeah. But you can feel free to also like teach the way however you want because then um, I feel like the viewers get a um, they get a variety of stuff they can come to the history channel to see because you know uh, obviously our, both of our presentations are very different so you know we, they get a taste of everything and our periods are very different so they get a, a little bit of everything. But well, I can make a Julius Caesar presentation really fun then. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, thank you. Uh, ben, for joining me today and teaching your lesson, Dr. Ben. What should be here? Yeah. Welcome to the faculty. Uh, your official yeah, tenure yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's look for a raid. Right. Let's see. Let's see who's who who's streaming right now. Actually, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Oh uh, yeah, perfect. I'm gonna see who's online to see if I have any mutuals to raid. If you'd like. Mm -hmm. I have a few. I also have a few. My yeah. goodness. Uh, do you know Graven? I have called Ah, I know, I know him. I know him. <laughs> do you know Graven? Ooh, I hear he's for hire this time. He's playing a spooky game, so maybe we can spook him. Oh, spooky. spooky. Let me let me queue up his raid really quickly. Graven. But thank you again, guys, for joining us. This is really fun. I love the, I love all the history lectures. Uh, here are my socials. You guys can follow my uh, uh, what I do on Instagram, where I post all my minis and all the updates I post on Twitter. Uh, because we hit 300 followers or 302 followers, I should say, uh, debut soon, soon for my de VTuber debut. Uh, vod from last week is going to come up within the next 24 hours, and this vod will come up in the next 24 hours as well. Look forward to it. If you guys uh, want to look on it, thank you, Vinci, for the for the congratulations. Couldn't have done it with all of you guys. You are awesome. Yeah, you're all amazing. Also follow uh, Professor Ben Boy Official. 
we have to we have to support all the history faculty here. <laughs> Our department's dying. By dying, we only have two staff. Can you believe it? But anyways, thank you guys again for joining us today. Um, we I will catch you tomorrow for a stream. I don't know what I'm streaming yet, but we'll see. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful, well, wonderful um, Thursday night and a wonderful weekend. We need this department funded exactly. <laughs> we have Twitch income for the funding. <laughs> I'm going to complain to the president that we don't have enough funding. Get some more faculty going. But anyways, uh, have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye.